Native Americans indigenous peoples of Reddit, what's it like to grow up on a reservation in the USA? When I was a kid I often visited my grandparents on the res in Montana. I was too young at the time to realize the crushing poverty and hopelessness. My grandpa was one of those self-sufficient mountain men who didn't ever complain so I didn't know they were super poor. He taught me survival skills and outback engineering. We ate venison and rabbit all the time which was a treat to me but a staple to them. Poverty and alcoholism drug abuse was rampant but I was sort of blind to that, Uncle Bert is sort of crazy I guess. They eventually moved to a small town and ended up dying in poverty. My dad joined the army and that was his ticket out of there and into the lower middle class. Cool story, bro. I loved it. My family was all within a 15-29 minute drive. I could run around in the woods and never felt like I was in danger. I could ride on the roads with my bike and felt safe. If I went to the store I was sure to see someone I knew. I was able to go to courts with my mother and watch our little courts do their stuff. I was able to call into out radio station and request a song and sometimes hear my voice on the radio. I was able to volunteer as a DJ and call out bingo numbers in my native language. I was able to become fluent in my native language. And that's something I could never do anywhere else. Growing up if I had a car issue someone I knew would stop and help me out. My grandfather was able to make a living off of the land. In the end we couldn't eat the food because of pollution from the manufacturing plants upriver. My family is here and that is the reason I love my reservation. And I will stay here until I am forced out. Mind you I can't live on the reservation anymore because I fell in love with a man with no clan but I work on the reservation and spend most of my time there. I'm Navajo, and from the Navajo Nation. The people were wonderful, for the most part. Being part of two of the tightest clans on the res was pretty awesome. A lot of Navajo culture is basically just about enjoying life, and helping others do the same. That being said, the best part about being off the res is having all the clean water I can drink. Seriously. Sometimes I just stand at the sink and run the tap to marvel at the clean water coming out of it. In large parts of the Navajo Nation, you can't dig wells because of the uranium in the top layer of the water table. So some people just have to drive out really far to deliver or pick up water in big barrels from areas that aren't contaminated. It took 40 plus years for the US government to do anything about it. And just recently, the EPA agreed to cover half the cost of cleaning 94, about 20% of the total, abandoned uranium mines on the reservation. The water table is still fricked, but it's a start, if nothing else. And people wonder why we don't trust the government. Not native but I've lived and worked near reservations in southern Alberta and BC and know people that are. Drug and alcohol abuse are common. The res near my hometown was really bad. Parents would call 9, 1, 1, and say that their child isn't breathing so ambulances would rush out full lights and sirens but the kid would be perfectly fine when they get there and the parents would be asking for a ride back to the city with their kid. Basically, leave their child at the hospital while they go party for a few days. An anecdote, a ranching family was breeding rodeo bulls and made a lot of money doing it. They were doing really well for themselves but lots of folk on the res were asking for cash based on blood ties. Young natives have a rough go if they want to get an education and get off the res. They'll be ostracized by their families if they're not guilted into staying. They're told that they'll just end up being a slave for the white man and crap like that. There's a massive stigma against natives where I'm from. You know the stories. Drunken Indian came up to me downtown at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Saw a native guy chugging a bottle of Listerine at the drug store. The sad part is that they're true. I don't think the government can solve these issues unless there's a massive overhaul of the reservation system and how issues are dealt with there. Cops hate working there. Paramedics hate responding to calls there. And it's a vicious cycle of alcoholism and drug abuse that keeps good people in a very bad spot. I grew up on my own reservation in Southern California I'm 19. I like to say that every res life is different. Some are poor and some aren't. That's just how it is. I went to the Indian school on my res with only members of the tribe as it was K5. Honestly there are so many things about the reservation that I'm so used to that other outsiders don't know. We have our own police. We call them rangers. We have our own government. Obviously. We are a sovereign nation. 
We have our own recreational center with basketball court and pool. We have our own casino. It's wonderful. I know other reservations are quite different. If anyone has any specific questions you can ask me. I'm very open and it's really difficult to offend me tbh. I've replied to a similar question before, but I'll answer again. The reservation my family is from is really, really poor. There is a rage epidemic. I've lost people to it. Feral dogs are a problem. People get them and lose interest. Or their dog has puppies and they take them to the dump site to be eaten by bears. Awful I know. Alcoholism is such a common thing. The water is bad. It's rusty and smells like sewage. And if you can't drink the water, might as well drink pop. You can use your food stamps even. This doesn't help with the obesity problem, which doesn't help the diabetic issue or the heart attacks. And I mean sure, the casinos bring on money. Where that goes I have no idea. I love my people man I just don't know how to help them. I don't live on a reservation, because they were never able to relocate my people. My tribe's also not federally recognized, funny coincidence that. One of the US government's favorite things is to harp on how reservations are sovereign territory when they ask for aid but then turn around and threaten to no longer recognize the tribe when they don't conform to some by rule. As you said a non-recognized tribe doesn't have a reservation nor do its members qualify for aid. It's not as bad as people make it seem. I don't live on a poor reservation or a rich one. It is in the southeast corner of Montana. We have a rich tradition of being the only people, along with Sioux, to beat the United States in any type of warfare. Our history stems from the Battle of the Little Bighorn. There is high unemployment but mainly because of people not wanting to work. They want handouts. Also M has overtaken alcohol in terms of addiction. And yes we get free healthcare. IHS. Due to treaties being signed back in the day, we don't all get casino money, free education, food stamps, etc. We pay taxes just like everyone else, have to pay for our room and board, some tuition, and all our books. Nothing in life is free or easy on the reservation, but I feel lucky because I graduated college, played college basketball and moved home to hopefully help young native youth a path they never thought was possible or to think about achieving it. I think it is important to note that there is a large diversity in the different tribes, corporations, rancherias, and the respective experiences of the natives who respond should reflect that diversity. I feel like there is a tendency for outsiders to confirm their beliefs about what life is like for natives, especially concerning poverty, lack of education, alcoholism and drug addiction, and upvote accordingly. While I am certainly not suggesting that these problems don't exist across many reservations, res dogs do seem to be everywhere. Get your pets fixed people. I feel like I need to encourage people to find stories beyond the cliche. Maybe look up the history of Foxwoods Casino and realize that no American bank would finance the deal because native sovereignty was and is still being defined. So they had to find an international investor, a Chinese Malaysian dude. Maybe look up the Native American bank and see how they are utilizing federal loan guarantee programs to get around the tribal trust land conundrum. Look up the tribal trust conundrum and realize that any economy with that much equity tied up is gonna be limited in terms of credit access and economic development. Maybe research. Lance Morgan and see how utilizing a triple section 17 company helped him turn a 9mm tribal grant into a 220mm international business. You could look up Gary Davis and realize that the actor from the Indian in the cupboard is a rapper and an advocate for tribal lending. More like using tribal sovereignty to online lend non-secured loans. Still an interesting test of tribal sovereignty. You could look up Stephen Paul Judd and see what contemporary native art can look like. My point is, there are a lot of neat things happening in Indian country. And at some point, I think we need to move away from glorifying how poor natives are and instead glorify the different solutions that natives are trying to solve their problems. Late to the party and will probably get buried, but hey, an AMA finally I can contribute to. I'm Navajo and I grew up on the Navajo Nation, which is the biggest reservation in the states. The only time I experience a difference is when I left for the Marine Corps and people would ask me questions like, 
Do you ride buffalo? Can you track animals? What's it like living in a teepee? Growing up on a reservation is nothing like that. It can be compared to living in an extremely rural area. For example, it's not uncommon to drive an hour one way for groceries. So most families buy in bulk. On the first of the month, the closest Walmart is overrun with rural folk and certain items such as coffee or chicken is marked up. Another side that people don't understand is that not all homes have electricity or running water. So that's why it's such a big deal when some company wants to frick with our water aquifer. There are a plethora of families that haul water and also depend on the livestock drinking well water. Other than that life on the reservation is the same as smaller town life in the USA. The first time you witness a man in a parking lot spraying hairspray into a rain puddle and sucking the alcohol off the surface is pretty eye-opening. Halito, chatter Sihok. I'm a member of the Choctaw Nation. The Choctaws are a fairly wealthy tribe now and provide housing and other things such as college to its members. After reading these stories I feel extremely blessed to have been born and raised Choctaw. Not USA but Canada. I am 18 and I come from a reserve in British Columbia. Still live here actually. This reserve is probably one of the better off reserves. Many reservations around here are poor because of lack of government funding or corruption. The one I happen to live in has an uncorrupted band which provides many jobs. Little history lesson. Many grandparents and parents were forced into residential schools. The purpose of these schools were to get rid of their culture. The schools did horrible things to the children. If you spoke your language you were hit. If you disobeyed you were whipped. You were forced to live in these schools and many children committed suicide or ran away. That's not even half of the atrocities committed in these schools. After the schools the parents had children and I was one. I am lucky my father did not suffer too much trauma because I couldn't imagine growing up with a dysfunctional abusive parent who would spend all the money on drugs and alcohol. Lesson over. I had a pretty normal childhood. I have many friends and both parents are still together. I am about as normal as everyone else, I suppose. Slight reddit addiction. Drink occasionally. Love memes. The only thing I was I knew more about was my own culture. TLDR. I am one of the lucky ones who have grown up with an education and without a drug addiction. Don't know much about my culture. No economy. No jobs. High unemployment. High suicide rate. Terrible land. And all the socio-economical problems that come with it. I'm at work but I can go on later if anyone's curious. My grandpa was from up here in Wisconsin. He hated it. Alcoholism. No work. He moved to Milwaukee with his mother and made something of himself. Went back once and was called an apple for making something of himself. Opened up a auto body shop. I grew up on a reservation in Washington state, and mine is small and actually pretty nice compared to some. What it was like, was not much different than living in a small town. What is different is that reservations are rather like their own country. They do not follow state law unless they feel like it, and federal law is the only thing that must be followed and even that can sometimes not be true. I guess it's kind of like living in a bubble. Generally low expectations from your fellow tribal members, and you get the same from people off reservation. So when you do well, and I mean really well, often people on the reservation are not always sure how to treat you, usually with insults and sarcasm. But, tribes are full of familial solidarity if nothing else. They can be mean to you, but God save someone off reservation being mean to you. My dad grew up on one, Fond du Lac, Minnesota. He told me many stories as I was growing up, of how poor his family was. His 13 brothers and sisters, that number is true, took turns wearing shoes. My dad's day was Tuesday, they didn't have toys like I did. They played with a stick and had to learn to share it, despite the fact that they lived in the woods. I'm a white guy. All put that out there at the beginning because this question was not addressed to me and as such you should be able to downvote my chiming in without reading all that much. I have lived near reservations for most of my adult life first in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado and now in Wisconsin. Here are some observations from those places. In Prescott, Arizona there is a reservation. It is very small and looks more like a nice subdivision. This is the exception and not the rule. Poverty FEMA style mobile homes are pretty common all over the US on reservations. 
Food is often distributed, but in most cases it is pretty crappy food. Res dogs there are tons of dogs without owners. Not everywhere but this is a pretty common thing. Some of these dogs are pretty mean, but some are just ownerless feral dogs who are nice to humans. I owned a former res dog. He was a great dog. Corruption tribal boards are often shadow controlled by local white groups. In the western US Mormon tide groups are often behind the scenes influencing tribal board members. Drugs and alcohol The reservations I live near now in Wisconsin are not dry. They sell alcohol on reservation and serve alcohol in the casinos. Bars are not really present on the reservations however. In the western US men or people have a long drive to get alcohol. In some cases over 2 hours. People don't wait to get back home to start drinking. Drunk driving is a pretty big problem. Drugs are a big problem as well and although I have found weed on res they don't really have too many problems with it. M and opiates are the primary drugs that cause very severe problems. Pollution resource extraction like mining and oil drilling happens pretty commonly on reservation lands. It is often done in a way that destroys food supplies and exposes people to toxic chemicals. Isolation people live pretty far away from town and each other. There are problems that are commonly associated with this like suicide and unemployment. From time to time I work with youth off the reservation. They spend their lives between two worlds. They have pressure to succeed as a white person while still being an Indian. I grew up on the reservation and lived there for 15 years of my childhood. Life, in general, was great I think for me as a kid. Of course. Mostly ignorant of the terrifying things that were happening around me but as a whole I think I had a good time. This was mostly because of my parents though and I'll explain why. My parents hated the reservation. They really only lived there because it was so easy and cheap. It was their land, their home. All essentially tax free and pretty much paid for. They hated the reservation for a couple of big reasons. A lot of people were racist towards my dad because he is white and tons of drugs and alcohol abuse from so many people including our own family. My family grew more accepting of my dad over time. However by the time we left the reservation there were still plenty of family members that couldn't stand him purely because he was white. To this day I'd estimate a good 75% of my cousins, uncles, nieces and nephews all do some kind of horrible drug and or are drunks. I've been to many funerals where the cause of death was overdose. It's honestly kind of disgusting and embarrasses me that there's so much drug abuse. But besides those things we lived fairly pleasantly on our own and try to keep to ourselves. Though on the good days it felt like one giant family friendly community. My native American family is huge, I have 12 uncles and aunts. They have almost 4-5 kids each which makes for around 60 cousins in the last handful of years those cousins have had tons of kids. I rarely go back to my reservation these days. I've moved 50 miles away and the only reason I sometimes go back is to visit my siblings who still live there. I never see my aunts, uncles, or cousins anymore as I don't even go to the family gatherings. I don't know if I ever really want to go back besides maybe a family gathering or two every handful of years. So yeah, that was my life on the reservation. Essentially my mom and dad hated it there. Stuck there for many years because it was cheap. I made no real connections to any of my family there over that time and moved away and never looked back. Grew up from age 11 16 on the res due to my parents divorce and my dad going to prison. Mother is FBI. Full blooded Indian. And my three siblings and I were uprooted into a horrible place. I knew people who committed suicide. Countless car accidents due to drugs and alcohol. People lived in broken houses that were literally broken buildings with no power or plumbing. People always wanted to fight me because I was lighter skinned and only half Indian. There were parts of my childhood that I stayed inside and read books because I was afraid to go out. I did so much coke and smoked weed and did acid all by age 16. I got pregnant at 17 and was in abusive relationships. My mom and grandpa were alcoholics both of which died from drinking. I hated my life so much then. I didn't belong there and can't even believe that I had to go through that. Anyways fast forward I go to school under scholarship program through the tribe and get me and my boy out. I build a way better life. Marry a really great guy and we build a life and take care of our kids. And things are really good. I'm glad my kids won't know anything about that life. Especially my son because he is Indian. His dad unfortunately was shot on the res and passed away. Res life sucks. 
Go on Netflix and watch the series Longmire and you'll see what is a good representation of life on a reservation, and a great show to boot. I'm from a larger, 4000, reserve in eastern Canada. My parents are both from different reserves so I spent some time at my dad's but mostly at my mother's where I lived for about 11 years on and off. What I love most about the community is that we have the language very well preserved. My mother and her side are fluent speakers, and I was able to learn the traditional craft of basket weaving through them. It is still very tight knit, with several prominent families extended who are more well off than others. I have been homeless on the res several times with my mother after she left my dad, but it never really feels that way because you always have family to turn to. The problem in this community is not alcohol but prescription pills, and has been spreading all around me as I got older and more exposed. My mother did a pretty good job of keeping me away from it and reminding me to stay traditional. I watched people all around me get sick and addicted to perks, painkillers. My auntie is an alcoholic and her daughter is 20 and on her fourth child, who is also recovering from a pill addiction. You can't wander around natural landscapes because it is pretty common for people to go to those areas and leave their hydro needles behind, often around playgrounds and beaches. One distinction I did notice was that everyone is an expert at raising a baby and a toddler, but raising a child is usually stopped by the time they are a teen and have a mind of their own. At that point the child's mother was also just a teenager, so educating beyond how to have kids isn't something that they can teach. Dropout rates are high, but our graduation rates are increasing. Unemployment is about 80% in this community, and more and more high school grads are going away for school and moving to better places. My mother was on welfare but I was able to get my degree funded and also joined the military because the res really is a place where dreams go to die. So I pretty much built my life with my own hands to get out. My best friend is my age and still stuck on the res. She graduated high school tried to move and go to university but her parents forced her to stay home to watch all their foster kids they adopt for the extra money, and use the old school family first guilt on her anytime she tries to leave and find a real job. What money she is able to make from her parents and welfare funds her drug addiction that she uses to cope with how trapped she is in her predicament. That is the cycle I had to force my way out of and any time I think of leaving the city and giving up and going back. I remember just how hard it really is to leave a jobless res once you're in it. I didn't quite grow up on a reservation, but rather a village in rural Alaska. Alaska natives an interesting history in their land claims settlement. I grew up in a small village called Chignik in southwest Alaska for most of my childhood. I played outside a lot, made my own entertainment, saw plenty bears, and learned how to harvest and prepare food from the land. My family were fishermen and hunted animals so that we had meat for the winter. Alcoholism is quite prevalent in villages, so I also grew up around alcohol abuse. I've also heard stories of sexual abuse happening throughout nearby villages. I moved to a city to attend school after living in Chignik. I don't think I could ever enjoy living in a village now, but I really do value learning how to harvest and prepare food from the land. I'm proud to be Alaska native and have grown up in the village, because we are people who know how to survive in the harshest of conditions and work together as communities to help other families too. Villagers are very strong, independent people. Education isn't stressed very much, but our leaders like to say it's important to sound good. Our own reserve schools are awful and they're essentially a daycare if nothing else. The main problem in our area is that if you want your kids to go to a decent school, outside of the reserve, you have to drive them in yourself. One thing that does stick out to my mind is how easy it is to be on welfare social assistance. If you have your own place on reserve, they'll pay for your utilities and power. With what you have from your social assistance checks, you could buy groceries or what have you. The moment you start working, you have to pay for all of that yourself. On the surface it seems fair enough, but it makes things overly difficult for people that want to work their way out, especially when it's a minimum wage job. There's no economy, and nothing to really bring any business into our little area. You pretty much have to know somebody in order to work in the local tribe band office. Other than that, if you aren't able to go outside of reserve for work, there are very few options. Everyone knows a res mechanic, but everyone also knows the res drug dealers, too. 
pretty much every stereotype of alcohol and drug abuse you hear reigns true. It's more uncommon to come across a young person who doesn't do all that stuff, at least on a reserve. It's sad. It's not uncommon to hear stories of abuse from friends, relatives, and other family members. In my mind, that's what leads to the substance abuse issues, at least partially. There are some lighter points to living on a reserve, too. When someone does pass away, everyone comes together to help out the family. It's nice to see, but it sucks that it takes someone dying in order to bring people closer together. It's like Cheers, where everyone knows your name. I think the most important thing for young natives to learn is how to pull themselves out of a rut. It's hard. It really is. Depression is no fun, especially when there are other issues at play. As long as you have a goal to strive for, it makes your obstacles a bit more bearable. I grew up very angry and resentful towards a lot of things. It was my way of saying I have no fault over my own problems. It's everyone else's fault to an extent. It might even be true, but nothing gets solved when you expect other people to fix your own problems. I also never had to worry too much about drugs or alcohol, as I was fairly sheltered early on in my life. That, and I have also always been somewhat of a nerd, so peer pressure and wanting to fit in was never really in my mind. I grew up for a portion of my life in the Navajo reservation. I learned that throughout my time there with my grandparents who I can't communicate with because they don't know English and nor do I Navajo, that there's a lot of grit in myself, my family, and my people. I learned what great value water has on our planet and not to waste it. I learned how to respect people in a way that feels good to my soul and is naturally followable. I learned many things from my grandparents despite never having a conversation with either of them. They truly are great people. Humble to the bone. You don't see people like that in the city. They're real diamonds in the rough and I appreciate every moment with them. I learned the great value that family is when you're close and don't hold grudges against each other. I learned what real love was because I never found it being bullied in school. You learn how to make do out there with what you got. I learned how to ride horses, herd sheep, and be a cowboy with boots on every day. Hard to believe I could be two different people in one. A city boy and a res kid. I got in my first group fight on the reservation. My brothers and I kicked their asses with minor losses of our own. We learned to be brothers even if we were friends or cousins. We were all brothers. I learned how to drive out there at 8 years old. I learned that I could do anything I ever wanted before any teacher ever tried to let me know. I learned how to feel special and believe in myself out there. Nothing in the world is like the res. It's a desert but it's beautiful and full of life that you wouldn't notice driving by. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. for now.